How and why does an economy grow? In our last lesson, we learned about the concept of interest. We found that contrary to the old concept of interest as a form of exploitation on the part of greedy capitalists, interest is actually a phenomenon which arises from the fact that humans act and therefore prefer the same satisfaction sooner rather than later. In our lesson on economic progress, we learned that capital accumulation was necessary for an economy to grow. But now we can introduce the concepts of time preference and interest rates in order to build a proper step-by-step -step perspective of how the mechanics of the free market work to build prosperity. What happens when, for whatever reason, individuals voluntarily lower down their time preferences and engage in acts of saving? To explain the logical steps of economic progress, let's start by assuming an economy which has no economic progress or economic losses and then suppose that people start saving. A general rise in voluntary savings is followed by three simultaneous effects. Let's analyze each step. The first effect, changes in the investment structure. A general lowering of time preferences in society, or we could simply say a general rise in savings, takes place when individuals reduce their present consumption in expectations of consuming more in the future. Rather than consuming their profits, capitalists can decide to invest a bigger part of these profits back into production. Or, workers and owners of natural resources can decide to not consume their entire income and instead take part in productive activities directly as capitalists themselves or both capitalists and workers can engage in voluntary savings. The important thing is that we are going to talk about a general lowering of time preferences, otherwise known as a net savings in society over net consumption. Prices are dropping at Rent-A-Center. The first effect of a rise in voluntary savings is a drop in consumer prices. This is because individuals have reduced their present consumption. At this point, however, a drop in consumption has not been accompanied by a fall in the expenditures of consumer goods businesses, and therefore, the industries closest to consumption suffer major accounting losses. However, we must keep in mind that the consumer goods sector is only a relatively small part of the entirety of the productive activities of a society. The effects of these accounting losses in the consumer goods sector won't be immediately felt by the capital goods sectors which are further away from consumption. This is because stages further removed from consumption at this point still find their incomes to be higher than their expenditures. Only after a certain amount of time passes do these stages start showing a depressive effect, like that of the consumer goods sector. To illustrate this first stage, if voluntary savings in society were to go up, we would find that the sales of consumer goods such as cars, televisions, and computers would go down. On the other hand, sectors which produce goods like iron, steel, bulldozers, cranes, tractors, and other capital goods used for the manufacturing of consumer goods would not experience the effects of this drop in demand. Therefore, they would remain at the same levels of profitability. A change in profit returns indicates to entrepreneurs that they should reduce their investment and demand for capital goods from less profitable areas, or in other words, stages closer to consumption, towards more profitable areas, or in other words, stages further away from consumption. The shift of investment into stages further removed from consumption starts a process that lengthens general production. This process won't end until the new rate of time preferences spreads uniformly across all sectors of the economy and to all stages of production. At this point, the difference between income and expenditure, that is, accounting profits, is lower than it would be in a time frame with a lower savings rate. To summarize this effect, the increased voluntary savings are invested in the stages further away from consumption. This embarks a lengthening of structures of production, which, as we will soon see, results in the availability of more consumer goods on the market. Now let's take a look at the second effect. As we understood in our last lesson, interest rates are nothing but the ratio between the prices of present goods against future goods. 
If individuals attach more value to future goods, as demonstrated by their increased savings, then this translates into a lower market rate of interest, that is, the going rate at which money is lent to borrowers, as well as the prices at which capital goods are purchased. As we studied in our lesson on the law of returns, the entrepreneurs evaluate a capital good, also called a producer good, based on the marginal productivity of that good in producing consumer goods. That is, the price of a capital good is the present value of its expected future productivity. Therefore, lower interest rates cause capital goods to have higher marginal productivities than at higher interest rates. Since the number of stages in which these capital goods are being used, as well as their distance from the final consumption, are increasing, their duration of serviceability goes up. The result is that the market prices of capital goods increase due to their higher marginal productivity as a result of a lower interest rate. Capital goods which are already in use will be produced in greater quantities and this will result in more production processes employing those types of goods. And finally, rock bottom interest rates. They're just encouraging new home construction even more. Welcome to space. At the same time, a lowered interest rate will reveal that many production processes that were not previously profitable now are. This will result in entrepreneurs starting businesses adopting new technologies that were once merely dreamt of. To understand the effects of lower interest rates on production within an economy, let's consider a one-man fishing operation. Before an increase of voluntary savings in society, interest rates were rather high. But once voluntary savings increase, interest rates drop. This reveals that the fisherman with a small boat can now acquire a larger fishing boat for his fishing process, which was earlier deemed unprofitable. So whereas in the previous state of interest rates, a larger fishing boat's yearly return was lower than the return on simply lending money out on the market, interest rates have now gone below the larger fishing boat's yearly returns. If the fisherman acquires a new fishing boat, or in other words, a new production process, we call this a vertical deepening of a structure of production. Similarly, if the fisherman expands his production with more units of the same capital goods, it's called a horizontal widening of a structure of production. To summarize this effect, increased voluntary savings result in a drop in interest rates which increase the valuation of capital goods in proportion to their distance from consumption. This also results in expansion of the general structure of production either through creation of more existing production processes or through creation of new lengthier production processes. Another effect we can observe of lowered time preference is on the stock market. A stock market is the market where the ownership of capital goods are traded. Increased voluntary savings and lowered interest rates increase the valuation of capital goods which are utilized by the production processes furthest from consumption. Therefore, at this stage, the stock prices of the companies involved in stages furthest from consumption go up. On the other hand, companies involved purely in the consumer goods sector would notice a temporary relative decline in their stock prices. Let's now observe the third effect of increased voluntary savings on the wages within an economy. As the prices of consumer goods come down, each worker is now immediately able to acquire more consumer goods. Although workers are paid the same amount of wages, or in other words, their nominal wages remain the same, they are able to acquire a greater quantity of consumer goods and services. This means that their real wages have gone up. To put it simply, a fall in consumer prices causes the real wages of workers to go up, even though their nominal wages remain the same. When entrepreneurs experience a drop in profits, they seek to adapt their production to a place where higher profit margins will occur. Since labor has become more expensive, their higher profitability lies in replacing labor with capital. Manually operated work processes will now be replaced by automated work processes. Shoe workers will be replaced by shoemaking machines, bank tellers by ATMs, and check-in operators at airports by automated kiosks. In other words, Entrepreneurs, upon finding labor to be more expensive than capital, invest in more capital-intensive production stages. Conversely, a fall in real wages would result in investment in more labor-intensive production stages. It's essential to understand that labor and capital goods are always in a state of constant competition. 
Capital goods replace labor when labor becomes comparatively more expensive. This phenomenon can be observed in any growing economy. In summary, in this stage, capital tends to replace labor as a result of a rise in voluntary savings. A common observation in this process will be a visible lowering of the workforce in the consumer goods sector, but a rise in the capital goods workforce. The final outcome of the effects of a rise in voluntary savings is an increased supply of consumer goods through a lengthier structure of production. A lengthier structure of production means a lot more consumer goods for the society at lower prices. In a nutshell, economic growth for society starts as the result of society's lowering of time preference, which lead to an increase in the proportion of saving and investment to consumption, and also to a falling rate of interest. These two effects act as a signal to entrepreneurs and enable them to invest in stages which are further removed from final consumption. With real wages rising, labor is also redirected from production of consumer goods to production of capital goods. Finally, when this expansion process ends, society has lengthier structures of production and a lot more consumer goods at drastically lower prices. Everyone is richer. We now have covered all the major aspects of the free market, starting from human action and its implications, proceeding to individual value scales and a money economy, we have demonstrated that the quantity of goods produced, the prices of consumers' goods, the prices of productive factors, the interest rate, profits, and losses all can be explained by the same deductive apparatus. Praxeology finds that the free market is an intricate system of voluntary exchanges between individuals seeking to satisfy their personal desires, which results in prosperity for all.